there is one thing that you need to really understand if you want to master your drums. And for that, I need this whiteboard. Okay, let's try this frequency curve. The first thing we are going to draw the loudness against the frequency. This is 20 Hz and this is 20 kHz. When you are dealing with the drums, you should split your bands into four. Your lows, mid lows, mid highs, and highs. We will use this concept and this will really help us explain how drums work. Understanding the business and frequency response is very important. The idea goes like this. The more you go up on the frequency band, the more crowded you can get with the drums. You don't have to, but you can. Make your choice. For example, here, maybe you have only one kick and one tom, and these ones are hitting once in a bar. So you have really very simple rhythm and two hits. When you approach mid lows, now maybe you have two to four, like there are four hits of same tom, or you have two different toms, but they hit twice in a bar. And then you go above, now maybe you start to have more driving percussions, and now suddenly we are having four to 16 over here. And when you approach the high end, this number can be anywhere. Maybe you have a lot of driving percussions, a lot of things going on. The way I like to show it is like on the pattern maybe you see one thing over here maybe you see two things over here and when you approach this there are so many different things are happening all the time let's take a look at these drums to understand a bit more the concept of fusiness it sounds like this sounds pretty cool if you take a look at first the low and this is what we have. Only thing that we really have is kick over here and a bit rumble drums. We can say every bar we have four hits and then we have the mid lows. It's quite simplistic. We have these driving toms. We have slightly more hits inside the bar. If you take a look at here, for example, it is three and together we got this. We still have quite a bit of space for mid highs. It's really playful. It almost looks like we double or triple the amount of hits over here. Now we also have three different sounds, so we are getting more complicated, we are getting more crowded. They just work. And the final thing, the highs, we have the 16 hats, so we are hitting constantly. And then we have these off hat symbols. And then comes the rights over here. And keeping business in check leads to these cool drums. The width of your stereo image really depends on which band you are working. Let me explain. Similar to the pattern and business, if you take a look at the stereo image, the more you go up on the frequency range, the more stereo you will get. It's pretty clear that when you have a kick, for example, it is right in the middle. And maybe you have some toms, but it is very close to the middle. And then when you go more and more up, maybe you have now much more stereo clap over here. And once you approach the highs, stereo image can get really wide. Things are all around splashy. This concept works because humans are much more sensitive to the stereo image on the highs. We are really utilizing this, keeping our drums tight, but still having this white stereo image. Now, similar to the business, image of your drums to stereo width also depends on these different bands that we have. Listen to this cool loop. Cool, isn't it? The one thing that I want to take a look at now is this width and how it behaves depending on which frequency band that we have. So the first band, the low end. Look at how tight we are. We are at one, that means that it's mono, it's super tight image. And let's take a look at the second band. We are loosening up a little bit, we have slightly movement, it's not that much. And let's take a look at the third band. Now we are having this mid highs. Now we loosen up quite a bit, down to around 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And interestingly, take a look at the high band. It's quite spread. We are almost approaching the zero now. Now this is the cheat. If I turn this off and take a look at my whole stereo image, you will still see that the image itself is pretty tight. And this helps us get that wide stereo image while keeping everything super tight. 
If you feel like these techniques will be helpful for you, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps a ton. When you have four different bands, the loudness relationship can be really easy to fix because we have very similar sounds and we can reference them to each other. So when you are balancing your drums, start with balancing your separate bands first. Let me show you on my Belton. This time, we have this loop over here. Obviously, mix is unbalanced, so we have to fix that. And at first look, it can be really overwhelming. We have 20 channels, 20 things for drums to be balanced. Where can you even start? Balance your bands first, and then balance your bands to each other afterwards. Cool, let's balance the toms. Let's balance the mid highs. Great, let's balance the hats. Great, now let's balance the bands. And here we go, it took us just a few minutes to fix everything. Almost like a cheat trick, isn't it? The call and response or question and answer is mysterious for many people, but it is quite straightforward. One of the trick with call and response is the calls often tends to be much more obvious if you do it on the low end. And the responses makes it more obvious if you use them on the high end. You can use the same concept even internally between the bands. Let's say I want to build a call and response for my toms. You can have two lower toms here and one upper toms here and this will sound like a call and this will sound like a response. Let me show you. I have this super simple loop. Let's build a call and response inside a band. In this case, I'm going to use toms, so low mids, and then we can do it between the neighboring bands as well. First of all, I have these three tom sounds. You see that we have the mid tom, high tom, and low tom. So if I go down, call, and if I go up, response. Take a look at the first part here. And then to respond it, we are gonna go up. Listen how not responding it becomes if I do the same thing over here. It sounds a bit off, isn't it? The moment that you pull that up, it suddenly fits. This is what I call call and response inside a single band. But you can interpolate it between bands as well. In this case, we have this sound. These both sounds are much higher than the previous sound that we used, in this case, tom. And if I use together, all together, Even though we have slight downward movement in the sound, it still works because they are still much higher than the original toms. Listen to these two different loops and try to guess which one has higher peaks. This is the first one. We are picking almost like a minus zero. And the second one? Even though there is almost 5 dB difference, the second one sounds louder. This is because the second one has much more saturated sound, the body of each sound is much more feathered, much more like a sausage. And this is an important concept to understand. If you want to have more in your face drums, the second option where you saturate and compress the sound will sound like that. But if you want to have your drums more dynamic and leave space for other instruments, the first one will fit better. But how to get that saturated fat sound? Let me show you three simple methods that you can use. The first one will be just using a clipper or limiter. On the drums, I really prefer clippers over limiters because they help the fullness of the drums. This is a free clipper that you can download. It sounds like this. The simplest method is just clipping the transient so that your drums has much less dynamics. And then you can actually boost the sound a little bit more so you get this louder, more saturated sound. Without. Anyway. The second method is using compression and saturation on your drum bus. Push the sound and clip it, almost like a clipper. 
In this case, I'm using this tube culture from Artria. It almost sounds like clip, isn't it? Bring down the output. You can actually use it in the parallel mode, but if you use in parallel mode, we will still have those peaks. So main idea is getting rid of those peaks to get this sausage form. If you still want to have a bit more dynamics, you can use a compression right after this one. Low attack and fast decay. A bit more dynamic sound, but still keeping that saturation because that's low attack, less the transient fast, but then starts the compress right after because release is very short. Original. Distortion. And compression. It is basically more saturated clipper in this case. If you want still more distortion and still want compression, there is one more method. You can move your distortion into the parallel mode. In this case, I'm going to take off the compression actually and then create a parallel channel. But in the first thing, I'm going to just use a simple clipper. This will control my dynamics so that I can bring it down slightly if I want to. Let's turn off the second chain so that we are only hearing that clipper chain. just a little bit 3 dB space and then what we are going to do on the parallel chain I'm going to go very aggressive with the distortion and compression. Let's pick something like Arturia Opamp 21. Right? Now the main idea here we're going to bring this now zero and play with the original one. Adjust the distortion a bit more. Now we have much more fat body compared to before, right? And we didn't add too much back dynamics either. Understanding the space is extremely important to really make coherent drums. Let me show you. I made this big snare sound that I really want to put in the front of my mix. It's a cool sound, but if I want this sound to work, I need to really respect my snare. I want to keep space for it so that we can hear all these reverb tails and the ambience that it creates. We have a cool percussion loop over here. But these percussion loops live exactly in the same space like our snare. And when you mix them together, look what happens. We miss that in your face feeling of the snare. There are two options for you. Either you remove these percussion loops, you cannot have tons of different fruit flavors, and then expect people to enjoy their chocolate vanilla ice cream. The first solution will be, of course, just take away all the different fruit flavors. Make it minimal. You can also keep the fruit flavor, but just a little bit sensation rather than whole flavor of the ice cream. The first thing we have done was taking off the overdrive and chopping the thumbs a little bit. It doesn't hit when the snare hits. almost like our call and response theory. And then for the percussions, let's say we really enjoy this. We could clean up the low side of the band a little bit. And then we could open up even more space by side chaining our snare to this sound. Really low release time, 10 milliseconds look ahead. So when the snare hits, we duck this sound very heavily. Pumps a bit. And this really helps snare to come through. Without. With. This percussion respects the snare. We had the final one. The same idea, clean up the snare parts and then push this more like a high band. Because it's a very stereo sound, we can also pan it right or left so that we open up even more space for the snare. Right. One thing that you should always remember is the space is not only a mixing problem, but it's also a creative decision. You should do this when you really want your snare or any other percussive elements to come through in the mix. Sometimes you want to blend things together and it's another creative decision because you feel like that fits your track more. Respecting space will be extremely crucial. Look at the difference that it makes. Old version. those percussions are just side flavors or main dish is still snare.
Last week, I was looking for the effects of the base on human brain, and I dived deep into the rabbit hole and found really cool facts about human brain and the base. I share what I find in this video. <laughs> 